and welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I am your host, Bob Pisani, but you knew that, right? After huge inflows last year in short-term treasury and money market funds, 2024 is already seeing some change in investor sentiment towards bonds. And that's our topic today. What's in and what's out in bond investing? Let's talk with David Botset. He's the Schwab Asset Management's Head of Innovation and Stewardship. Schwab is the fifth largest ETF provider with over $300 billion in assets. Also here, remote Nate Geraci, ETF store president and an all-around expert in ETFs. Uh, so, David, at the last ETF conference, last week we were in Miami Beach, you and I, chatting, um, and we were talking about 2023. It was the year short-term treasuries. Uh, it was the year money market funds. 2024 seems to be shaping up to be something a little bit different than that. What, what's going on? Where's the flow? What are you telling people? Yeah, we're, we're seeing more flow in the intermediate space of, of the fixed income curve. I think people are starting to realize that we're kind of at the peak of interest rate increases. So they're looking to reposition the fixed income portion of their portfolio to take advantage of where interest rates are likely to go next. So explain this to the viewers. The reason you should consider going from, a, say, a short-term fund, which is, what, less than a year yes. uh, in maturity to something that's more intermediate. Intermediate means what, three to five years? Three to five years, sometimes out to 10 years. And the reason you should be considering doing that is why? Because when, it, when interest rates come down at such point, you not only get the income from that bond, you get price appreciation because yields and prices of right. bonds are the inverse. So basically, they're not going to be, rates are going to be coming down, the shorter term rates, your expectations. Yes. And going towards the intermediate side of the curve there, the middle of the curve, the chance of them coming down is less. What's the, the point yeah, here? In, in most cases, it, it is less. And that's what the yield curve is showing us. It's the yield curve, you're actually seeing higher rates on the short end. Right. But the long term expectation is where, where those intermediate terms are today. So you'd likely see that less likely for those to come down, you'll be able to capture that yield for a longer period of time. You know, Nate, you and I have been talking about this as well. And you've been telling me um, fixed income is a bit of a, a, a challenge for investors uh, and even advisors um, right now. Uh, what are the issues as you see them, and where do you see the money going right now? It's interesting because if you look last year, over a trillion dollars went into money market funds, which made sense in many ways. Investors were content to scoop up 5% plus yields, call it a day. They didn't have to hassle with decisions around duration risk or credit risk or whether the Fed could actually orchestrate a soft landing. The challenge now, though, is should investors stay parked in cash or should they venture out on the duration and credit spectrum? I don't think there's necessarily an easy answer here other than if you stay parked in cash, you're obviously taking on the risk that if rates do come back in, you're gonna leave some return on the table. Uh, I think to what David was speaking to, from my perspective, I think taking on some duration risk makes sense, but I wouldn't go too far out on the curve. I, I just don't, the, the, the risk return dynamics getting too far out on the long end don't make a ton of sense to me. On the credit side, I do think it makes sense to look at corporates. You don't just have to stay in treasuries as an investor. Uh, I would favor investment grade over junk. And if you look at flows this year in the ETF space, we have seen flows into that short to intermediate uh, part of corporates. So do you agree with David's point that it makes some sense to consider moving more into the intermediate part of the curve? Uh, less chances rates are going to go, it'll be more stable. Does, does, does what David say make some sense? I, I do, with the one caveat being that if we look at how the Fed has handled this battle against inflation, and even go back to a couple of years ago when they were slow to react as we started seeing the CPI data come in, if you're starting to go out on the curve, you're making the bet that the Fed is actually going to get everything right this time. And they very well may, the data looks like that's where we're heading, but that's not a sure thing. And that's why I wouldn't go too far out on the curve because I don't know that, look, inflation data could still continue to come in hot. The last print we saw was, uh, was higher than the market anticipated. So the Fed may stay higher for longer. And I just think you have to be cognizant of that as an investor. So, so, David, we, your point here is we're already seeing inflows into these intermediate term corporate bonds. Schwab's got a bunch of them. Well, how about I like to flip it around. What's what are we seeing outflow from? We, we were talking about tips last year, Treasury inflation protected securities. These are bonds that are indexed to inflation. Um, so 
we should be seeing outflows, right? If, if inflation is going down, the value of tips should decline, right? Yes. Uh, and that was a very popular investment two it, years ago. It was, and we did see that, especially in the second half of last year, where we saw outflows from the tips ETFs across the marketplace. So outflows from there, and that makes some sense, right? Yes. Okay, we don't need it as much. All right. Now, I want to go back to Nate's point about corporate bonds. I mean, corporate bonds had a, a huge rally at the end of 2023, along with everything else, guys. Uh, as you know, the yields gone down, prices up. But the yields have backed up, you know, recently in the last month or so. So prices are down. But there, there's also been inflows here. And I want to show you the yield differential here. This is very important because here's your risk here. You're getting 5.6 percent yield for corporate bonds. This, I, I think this is your yield right now. Uh, versus 4.3 percent for comparable treasuries, and again, I'm, I'm taking this off. I believe this is Schwab's uh, both intermediate term ETFs. So there's what you're getting compensated. There's your extra risk right there: 5.6 percent versus 4.3. Can you make an argument right now for owning corporates over treasury giving? You're getting a 1.3 percent higher, 1.3 percentage points higher. And, and I think that's I agree with what Nate was saying. There is there is a case to be made right now where there is a yield pickup that's sufficient to warrant corporates over treasuries at a similar duration level. Yeah, so you're getting the, 100 basis points in incremental yield there. Yeah, so, so the, I mean, do you agree with this, Nate? I mean, it, it seems to make sense to me if you're assuming right now that there is no imminent risk to the economy, uh, that there's no credit risk, and I'm not even talking about high yield, I'm just talking about corporate. I think that 5.6 is fairly attractive versus 4.3. Again, assuming we're, we don't have enormous risk in the economy, which would create, you know, credit risk here. I, I yeah, and that assumption is the key. Yeah, the assumption that you just made, that's the key part here, because if the Fed botches this soft landing, then clearly that's going to present some risk to corporates. What's interesting to me is if you look at the flow data right now so far this year, money has come out of ultra short and short term treasury ETFs and even floating rate treasury ETFs. And we've seen investors going further out onto the curve into longer dated treasuries, as we've talked about earlier, but also on the corporate side. You, you look at the flows, we've seen flows in the multi sector bond ETFs such as BND and AGG, and then on those investment grade corporates, particularly on the short and intermediate part of the, uh, the curve. ETFs like VCIT and VCSH and LQD, those are leading the way. So investors are clearly circling around this area right now. Yeah, I, I, honestly, th as an investor, I made fun of my mother last year who called me in March and said, Robert, I'm at the bank. She was a head bank teller for three years at the bank. The girls are telling me I can get 4% of my one, one year CDs. She said I was getting 0.3% now. And she, I said, mom, that's a good deal. And she said, well, Robert, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. I said, well, the banks are not because they're going to have to pay you more to keep that money in your bank account and not put in a one year CD. And she said to me, Robert, I could care less about the bank's profitability. I got nothing from them for years. And millions of people did what my mother did, just what Nate was telling me about, including putting money into uh, in, in, into uh, into short term bond funds as well as, you know, what money market funds. I, I think that's exactly right. But when you start to think about those investors, I, w I would argue that there's caution to be had if your mother She's taking it from her bank account to go into the CDs. You know, those those are the dollars typically you're going to allocate to short and intermediate yeah. term bonds. Yeah, she's not going right. to suddenly buy Nvidia. Exactly. Out of that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Very sticky money. But five points. Doesn't this strike you as more normal than it was a few years ago? You know, it, normal to me, four five percent on a ten year seems a lot more normal than one percent a few years ago. That people thought that was suddenly got used to that 3% 30-year mortgages. That's not normal. It never has been like that. And now everybody's whining that they can't get a 3% 30-year mortgage. I'm sorry. It was 11% when I bought my house in 1985. It's come down, thankfully. But 6% is a lot more normal historically than 3%. It, it is. We've been living in this long bond market rally for so long. We're finally through that. We're in a much more normalized environment. I actually think it goes back to, you know, the old 60-40 portfolio, which 18 months, 24 months ago, we said was yeah. broken. And suddenly that type of allocation makes sense again because we're in a more normalized rate environment. Yeah, I remember two years ago at the ETF conference, zero discussion about bonds because nobody wanted anything to do with it. Nobody's going to do it. And now look how fast things change around. Speaking of uh, 
active management, Nate, I know you mentioned it, uh, active fixed income were a huge story at the uh, exchange we were all at uh, a week ago in Miami. So explain to the viewers, well, what does active get you in, in bond portfolios versus passive? Well, first of all, just to your point, it was unbelievable. From my perspective, actively managed fixed income ETFs were absolutely the, uh, the conference darlings at exchange. It was a huge topic. And it's crystal clear to me that ETF issuers are focusing on this category for several reasons. I think one, issuers see that there is white space here. Because if you look at most ETF categories, they're pretty saturated, but active fixed income is one where issuers believe they can still offer some value and perhaps innovate a little bit. And that really gets into your question that, you know, I think the value here is given the, the market dynamics that we were just discussing. Um, I think some investors, because of that challenge, they're comfortable handing the keys over to an active manager to help solve that. You, you know, does the Fed get this landing correct? Um, should you take on duration risk? Should you take on credit risk? Instead of an investor or advisor making those decisions, they're more comfortable handing that over to an active manager to, to solve. And I think the other thing here too, Bob, is if you look at the historical track record of active management, you and I know the data very well on the equity side, which isn't good. The data does look much better for active managers on the fixed income side. And so I think investors and advisors are a bit more open to active management within fixed income compared to the uh, to the equity side. I guess the question is, how much real value is this going to add in, in, in the long term? I mean, it, Nate hit upon the key point here. Indexing is pretty saturated. I mean, we've got all of the, look how successful Schwab was in moving into this space. You're the fifth largest provider, largely on, on indexing. Yes. And you guys just moved right in because you have such a large base of, of users out there. You were able to, to successfully, you know, make a big splash in the ETF space. Uh, and yet, we know the industry has to grow, and the way to grow is by active, because that's not saturated. My question, though, as an old Jack Bogle disciple is, are they really adding a lot of value? Do, do you feel, I mean, I, Nate apparently thinks that they are. Some of them probably do. Are, are there advantages to being active? I, I'm dancing around the question, which is, is, is there something unique about bond trading that allows in, quicker innovation? You know, the guys in, in equities. They always say, oh, wait till volatility comes. That's when the active guys are really going to do well. And it's never proved to be true. Yeah. They generally do not. Is there any academic evidence that active management and bond funds, and they can react quicker, will make some kind of do? I'm trying to make a case here for yeah. the viewer. Why would I bother? Why would I add, if I have a nice portfolio of ETFs that are indexed, what, what is the value proposition in adding active management? Does it help? Does it do outperformance? Does it tampen down volatility? Well, I, I think you, you look at it and you say, what, what am I, what's the bigger concern of my portfolio? If it's cost, indexing is the way to go. If you're looking for the potential to outperform, active and fixed income has demonstrated the ability to do that over time. Let's just use aggregate bond index. You know, it's one that many ETFs track. Well, the, the exposure you're getting to treasuries versus corporates versus mortgages is dependent upon the amount that's issued in each of those categories. You're just tracking that index. Over time, it's performed well, and managers can demonstrate they can closely track that index. But if you think in this environment, that should be more heavily weighted to corporates over treasuries because of the yield differential, that's something that an active manager can do. Yeah, you, you get my point here, Nate, right? Yeah, I'm, you're, you're an average guy like me, and you've got an index portfolio of uh, S&P and you know, small cap value, et cetera, in a global bond market. Can, I, can you make a case why I would add an active management component to this? Does it tamp it down volatility? Does it improve returns? What's, I guess, what's the value proposition here? Well, look, first, uh, I think you know I am an old school indexing uh, proponent, and so I think it's always tough to beat index-based investing. That said, my experience is that a lot of investors and advisors, they're very comfortable when it comes to the equity side of the equation, uh, doing some active management on their own, but they're not as comfortable in the fixed income space. And so when the environment is challenging, like I think we're in now, because again, while yields have come up, we haven't had this type of environment for, for yeah. several decades. And so I think that they're much more comfortable being able to outsource that to an active manager and feel like maybe there is some value proposition there that they can squeeze out a little bit of extra yield without taking on as much risk. Yeah. And if you look you at know. the historical data, it is better 
for, for fixed income on the active side, still not great. Uh, but I, it makes sense to me why investors are looking to active managers in this environment. Okay, but I want to move on. I get, you get my point, folks. I'm skeptical about the active management thing. Remember, they charge more. So the alpha has got to be even more pronounced to make up for the higher costs, okay? Jack Bogle, got to go back to that. I want to move on to a couple of topics. This is a sensitive issue for me, obviously. NVIDIA's earnings uh, are out today. Now, look, we've had a lot of discussion at this ETF conference last week about the concentration risk in the S&P 500 and the importance of uh, diversification. Uh, the, the RIAs, the investment advisors, they were beset by uh, in investors calling up saying, oh, why am I not yeah. more in the Magnificent Seven or why am I too much in the Magnificent Seven? So how, that, how does Schwab think about this? What do you tell your investors? You about? know, we, we really talk to them about using a combination of cap weighted and smart beta. But we have a lineup within our, in our offering, the Schwab Fundamental Index ETFs. They select and weight constituents by non-price measures. So therefore, you're not as highly concentrated to those magnificent seven. But when you combine it with market cap, you kind of get the ebbs and flows. You get the momentum from the market cap. You get uh, that, that better diversification. So be more specific. You're saying use... They, they, they select the securities in, right. the, in, the, in the index based upon non-price weighting. So they think about earnings and fundamental factors. Make quality stuff. E ex exactly, exactly. Yeah. In which case, you underweight those momentum-oriented securities that can be a counterbalance to traditional market cap Do you have a quality weighted. ETF? This sounds like you're describing it, that. I mean, it's not a quality. That's the Schwab Fundamental Index ETF. So we've got a suite of What's those. What's the symbol for that? Uh, we, we've several got ones. several of yeah. them. FNDF is our international, which is one of, one of our larger ones in that space. Yeah. Um, so do you agree with this, Nate? I mean, the, the diversification issue was a big topic last week. And so what was funny was to watch the panel on this tie themselves up in knots saying, essentially, no, you shouldn't be throwing a lot of money into Magnificent Seven. But as an alternative, sell your clients on momentum, you know, MTUM, or send, sell, sell it on quality, QUAL. These are ETF symbols we're throwing out, folks, here. And it was funny, Nate, to watch everybody sort of tie themselves into knots trying to say, well, there's proxies that you can use <laughs> for the Magnificent Seven that aren't exactly the Magnificent Seven. So does this all make any sense? It seems diversification risk is a genuine issue. In the yeah, I think there are two very important points to be made here. I mean, you look right now, the Magnificent Seven stocks comprise nearly 30% of the holdings in the S&P 500. So seven stocks represent 30%, which is as about as concentrated as we've seen the S&P 500. But, th but the points I would make here or one, this is what you sign up for when you invest in market cap weighted yeah. indices, yeah. right? It's important to remember that investors who have been invested in the S&P 500 have received the benefit of this concentration as stocks have powered higher. So that's obviously a positive. Now, on the other hand, to what David was hitting on, look, I, I don't think there's any question concentration does present some risk here. And there are different ways you can approach it. You can look at smart beta ETFs. You know, from my standpoint, I just think the overall diversification in a portfolio is critical. So yeah. we have yeah. mid cap stocks, small cap stocks, international stocks. It's not necessarily shun market cap weighted indices. It's to make sure you don't have everything right. in the S&P 500. I am not as worried as everybody else. First of all, this has happened in the past. This 30 percent number you keep mentioning in the late 90s, there was a tense concentration the same way. And even with the Nifty 50 70 years ago, I think the top 10 stocks were close to 30% of the S&P at that time. So this is not unprecedented. The great thing about owning an index is it self-corrects eventually. You become, you just like you partake in the advances of the Magnificent Seven, if other stuff, equal weighted stuff starts moving up, you will participate in that, even if you're in a market cap weighted index. So I am not as worried as everybody seems well, to be. And, and Nate makes a, a really strong argument for the case for diversification, Yeah. right? Not only the S&P, but mid cap, small cap. You are but, diversified in the S&P though, that's the point. Though. But but also looking back at rebalancing yeah. your portfolio when it gets out of whack, understanding what Good is my point. strategic allocation, how do I, I stay I want to get there? a second topic in before sure. we got to go here. And that's, uh, guess what, spot Bitcoin ETFs, of course, you can't go by a week without mentioning that. So we've had, what, $5 billion, um, Nate, in uh, inflows in, in five weeks. So we've had these 10 spot Bitcoin ETFs. They've been successful. They track well. But 
I, I characterize the flows. To me, the overall flows seem still fairly modest. Uh, much of it is coming out of grayscale and going into the other ETFs, uh, Bitcoin ETFs. Your thoughts on this, Nate? Well, I would counter that a little bit. I mean, you look here to date, two spot Bitcoin ETFs are in the top eight of all ETF flow getters this year. So the iShares Bitcoin Trust, iBit, that's number three in inflows, and then the Fidelity Wise Origin Bitcoin Fund, ticker FBTC, that's eight. Uh, but as you were saying, overall, spot Bitcoin ETFs have now taken in over $5 billion in net flows in just over five trading weeks. So that's nine new ETFs that have taken in over $12 billion because the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust has had over $7 billion in outflows. In my mind, I don't think there's any way to characterize that as anything other than a monumental success. Again, five trading weeks, $5 billion in net flows. Now, what happens moving forward? We'll see. But... A lot of these ETFs are just now getting approved on various platforms. I think advisors are just now getting comfortable yeah. with these ETFs. So I, I think there's a, a positive, a pretty strong tailwind behind this. What was this interesting category. to me at this, listening to the conference, was a lot of the, half of the RIA seemed very interested. The other half seemed terrified of the legal consequences. You know, Gary Gensler fired a shot across the bow yes. at all of these people when he, when he conceded the Grayscale case and said, may I remind all you people out there, you RIAs, that you have reg best interests that requires suitability requirements, and that means you better be darn careful about selling Bitcoin to grandma, as I like to call it. Uh, you could potentially get sued there. So I'm sure I, some of the RIAs I talked to were clearly uncomfortable with what's the legal requirements for me to follow. This is new. We don't know, right? And, and where does it fit in the portfolio? Talk yeah. about diversification. Where, where does it slot in? Yeah. What's the right percentage if it is the right right allocation for yeah. clients. Well, what about Schwab? You guys haven't done anything, right? Is there any consideration? Or is well, I, I can never comment on what we may be considering in the background. What I can say is we'll do the same thing we always do, and that's put the investor first. Understand what the investor needs are, take that in, and that guides our product development. What are you reading from the Charles Schwab playbook or something here? <laughs> you you memorize that sentence? I've interviewed Charles Schwab. I know, I know him. That's exactly what Charles Schwab would say. You're sounding like Charles Schwab over there. Go well, it's work. high compliments. Then. Go wait for Charles. <laughs> Go work for Charles Schwab. Oh, wait, you do work for Charles Schwab. All right, we got to stop. Stop, Bob. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. My thanks to David and Nate. Uh, we've asked Nate to stick around and give us his perspective on broader ETF trends for the ETF Edge podcast that is coming up right now. And remember, you can see all of our shows on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter. Your weekly update on the hottest trends, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Fasani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.